Voi dovete impedire che un pugno di ruffiani e di frodatori riesca a imbrattare l'Italia. Tutte le azioni necessarie assolva la legge di Roma. E l'arte è la più nobile delle imprese. E qui riuscì a rivedere le stelle. Le storie e le azioni degli uomini eccellenti. Dobbiamo meritarcela, la storia che ci è capitata. Qualcuno ce l'ha pagata. Non fu gratis. E naufragare le dolci in questo mare. Tanto maggiori sono gli ostacoli e tanto più precisi di vista deve essere la nostra volontà di sperarli. Io direi che è stato creato un grande patrimonio e che appartiene alla collettività nazionale. Appartiene a tutti gli italiani. One of the most important philosophers of the modern era and one of the most forgotten, is Giovanni Gentile. Gentile's ideological predispositions provide an indisputable alibi for the silence surrounding his thought. Most of his work has not been translated from Italian, limiting his prospective audience significantly. Gentile holds the title of the philosopher of fascism granted by Benito Mussolini, yet his philosophy of actualism is almost completely unknown. Gentile is an example of proof that Italian fascism was also quite an academic and intellectual movement. Mussolini said, It was Gentile who prepared the road for those like me who wished to take it. Furthermore, Gentile's former colleague, the liberal Hegelian philosopher Benedetto Croce, went on to say that Gentile was the most rigorous Hegelian in Western philosophy and had the dishonor of being the official philosopher of fascism. From what both Mussolini and Croce said, we begin to see how Gentile fits. It's understandable why the Italian Marxist philosopher Diego Fusaro considers Gentile one of the greatest philosophers in Italian history. Historian A. James Greger, an expert on fascism, claimed that just as Marxism as a social and political philosophy was the product of the genius of Karl Marx, fascism considered as a social and political philosophy was essentially the product of the genius of Giovanni Gentile. While both Marxism and fascism as doctrines were the product of many hands, the master hand behind fascism was Gentile's. His formulation contained the essence of fascism, he was its Karl Marx, and his system of philosophy, actualism, was its historical materialism. Articles like Giuseppe Parlato, Giovanni Gentile, from the Risorgimento to Fascism are crucial today. It brings a neglected figure to fore while opening our minds to ideas from the past that we have been made all too ready to forget. Parlato's article talks about Gentile's thought during the different phases of his life. Doing so sheds light on fascism's ties with the Risorgimento, Gentile's posthumous influence, and to some extent the alleged iron bond between Mussolini and Gentile. Parlato also highlights Gentile's greatest achievements. Among those are the creation of the Italian Encyclopedia and his appointment as Minister of Education. The article also gives insights into the theoretical roots and political parentage of fascism. This topic is all too often neglected, and when it is discussed openly, the treatment it receives is rather simplistic. Parlato presents readers with a sketch of Gentile's political philosophy. The article rightly stresses how the kings of the Risorgimento, Mussini, Gioberti, and Cavour, influenced and inspired Gentile to the point that fascism was for him the continuation, the completion, and the realization of the Risorgimento. It's true that Gentile's philosophy grew out of a Hegelian environment. However, unlike the Neo-Hegelians in the Anglosphere, who held on to an absolute and monistic view of reality, Gentile holds to a more subjective view, which he calls actual idealism, or simply actualism. Some have tried to remove it from its Hegelian title, for example Herbert Marcuse of the Frankfurt School, who stated that his philosophy when judged by its content and not its language has nothing to do with Hegel. And for the slack of the absolute, Marcuse thinks he is undeserving of the term Hegelian, and he is definitely different from other Hegelians for this reason. His philosophy takes elements from Kant, Fichte, Vico, Bertrando Spaventa, and many other philosophers of the Italian Renaissance, including his colleague Croce. In fact, he is not afraid to point out the problems he sees in Hegel. Marcuse gives what may be one of the most mixed attacks on fascism. It's good that he starts off pointing in the direction of a good honest attack on the fascist philosophy, better than most intellectual critics of fascism, but he simply could not help but take it to the most absurd places. Marcuse ends up accusing Gentile of similar crimes if he himself is guilty of. For example, he states that Gentile was not a truly an idealist because of his view of mind and body. He was more like a positivist without much explanation. <laughs> 
But Gentile was an idealist, and he gives an argument for idealism that sounds a lot like the argument given by a lot of other idealists. Reality is conceivable only insofar as the reality conceived is in relation to the activity which conceives it, and in that relation it is not only a possible object of knowledge, it is a present and actual one. To conceive reality is to conceive, at the same time and as one with it, the mind in which that reality is represented and therefore the concept of a material reality is absurd. One quote sums up his form of idealism, but it needs to be explained to show how Hegel infamously wrote a preface attacking prefaces. Like a preface in philosophy, a quote makes more sense after you already know how they think. The spirit is never really that pure theoretical activity that is imagined to stand in opposition to practical activity. There is no theory or contemplation of reality that is not also action and thus the creation of reality. Indeed, there is no cognitive act that does not have a value or, rather, that is not judged, precisely so far as it is a cognitive act according to its exact conformity to its own law and whether or not it is recognized as being what it ought to be. If we were not the authors of our ideas, or, rather, if our ideas were not purely our own actions, they would not be ours. We would be unable to judge them. They would have no value. They would be neither true nor false. Like Marxism, Giovanni Gentile's philosophy of actualism recognized the man as a social animal. Unlike the Marxists, however, who viewed community as a function of class identity, Gentile considered community as a function of culture and history of a nation. Actual idealism, or actualism, saw thought as all-embracing. No one could actually leave their sphere of thinking or exceed their thought. This contrasted with the transcendental idealism of Kant and the absolute idealism of Hegel. Gentile holds that reality, for this reason of our active thinking, becomes universal and something outside of our thinking is something outside of reality. His view has been attacked as solipsism, and Gentile responds to this attack. The problem for Gentile is that solipsism holds to a particular and negative ego, and actualism holds onto a dialectical ego and makes itself a thing and not a spirit. It can exclude other egos. We must think about other minds and have a unification with other minds, and without such there could be no understanding. It is not my mind or your mind, but rather our mind. He even speaks of an infinite unity. The dialectical concept of mind, then, not only does not exclude, it requires spiritual multiplicity as an essential mark of the infinite unity of mind. Infinite unity is therefore infinite unification of the multiple as it is infinite multiplication of the one. The crux of Gentile's philosophy is the idea that the human spirit is the creator of all reality. In other words, there is nothing that is not created by the human subject through thought. This makes the human subject the center of all there is, conferring absolute freedom to it. Gentile's philosophy is a system, which is to say an apparatus stemming from a metaphysical core and branching out in several directions towards disciplines such as history, ethics, and aesthetics. In this way, Gentile follows Hegel by saying the spirit is the director of world history. The Mazzinian principle Gentile adopts for the spirit is a binary of thought and action, which he reinterprets as an intense type of intellectual militancy. It confers to the intellectual a vital duty to make an impact in the world. Military life becomes the model for discipline, first moral and philosophical, and only then confronting to regulations in which the intellectual discovers militancy. Since the intellectual cannot avoid dealing with the difficulties of history, he cannot simply resign himself to his educational function. Gentile took philosophy into the field while following the steps of the Risorgimento with the aim of shaping a nation. Gentile believed with undying fervor that Mazzini and the others were not dead. Rather, they somehow lived vicariously in fascism and the propria persona of Mussolini. This is also why fascist intellectuals like Gentile consider the state as the primary actor over the nation, as shown in the following quote. For fascism, on the contrary, the state is a wholly spiritual creation. It is a national state, because from the fascist point of view, the nation itself is a creation of the mind and is not a material presupposition. It is not a datum of nature. The nation, says the fascist, is never really made. Neither, therefore, can the state attain an absolute form, since it is merely the nation in the latter's concrete political manifestation. For the fascist, the state is always in fieri. It is in our hands, holy, hence our very serious responsibility towards it. The Italian sense of nation or race had to be essentially constructed by the state. The idea of a unified Italian nation, as the Risorgimento posited, was absolutely modern. 
Because of this, the idea of an Italian nation took on spiritual terms. In this way, it was even poetic. This is seen by Gentile's various references to poetry, like the celestial eagle in which Dante saw in paradise, to reach a Rousseauian general will. Fascism proclaimed the consciousness of the mind to be the basis of reality. As a result, Gentile had to seemingly create critical theory first. This was used to construct the Italian national identity, which was otherwise not actualized due to the decentralized sense of ethnos in Italy at the time. People identified more with their regions and cities than they did with the concept of an Italian nation. It was this critical theory of fascism that gave rise to a sense of Italianness and thus the self recognition of an Italian nation or race. There are two aspects to Gentile's critical theory consciousness construction and consciousness deconstruction. Both these aspects are useful tools in creating new social constructs, maintaining current social constructs, or destroying old and outdated social constructs. Moreover, Gentile had lamented that despite the spirit of the Risorgimento, the period of Italian unification, the Italians still thought of themselves as citizens of a particular city or province, not of a nation. In his eyes, the propulsive force of the Risorgimento could only be renewed by a conflict, for conflict alone is capable of merging individual interest in a general will. Gentile says this, War does not have its end in itself. War is the insaturation of peace, resolution of a duality or plurality in the collective will, the realization of which is eminent in conflict, representing its true raison d'etre and its proper meaning. He argues that war is the result of particular interest, yet to understand their particular interest which can only be pacified through the ordeal of war. He then specifies that conflict should be understood not as a transitory phase between individualism and a universal substance that negates individualism, but rather as a necessary movement in the spirit's dialectical life, for there can be no peace without war. Thus, philosophically, Gentile understands war as a dialectical phenomenon, part of the unification process of the multiplicity of wills in society. In that sense, war is both the signal of a lack of unity and the first step towards its resolution. Given that war had been the fundamental idea of fascism, Gentile shows how war and struggle were pivotal in the thought of Mazzini, and therefore fascism too. It's seen as a conception of ethics, according to which duties, i.e. sanctity of duty, always precedes rights. Consequently, rights cannot be claimed unless duties are complied with first. Politically, Mazzini uses the primacy of duties to make the argument that people have a duty to form a race and, consequentially, a nation. The construction of the nation must be achieved not through solidarity, but struggle and war. That war, which, like Mazzini wrote in 1855, war is sacred, like death, and, like death, gives access to a holier life and a higher ideal. The idea that a nation is created through struggle and war is fitting, with Mazzini's belief that life is neither spectacle nor enjoyment, but a struggle, sacrifice. Rights cannot be obtained from above, but must be conquered through insurrection and martyrdom. Thus, for Gentile, faith in the Mazzinian project of the Risorgimento should not be abandoned, but rekindled in Italy's new spirit. In Gentile's Mazzinian thought, war is the unification strategy. This is why he supported the First World War, including the later expansionist measure taken up by Mussolini against both Libya and Ethiopia. Gentile also references Vladimir Lenin's April Theses, citing his argument that war provided the necessary and accelerating catalyst for revolutionary changes within society. It may be useful to talk about Gentile's relationship with Hegel in this context too. Hegel being an absolute idealist in contrast to the subjective idealism of Gentile. First, Gentile sees in the old Platonic idealism, which persisted throughout Aristotelian, Neoplatonist, Scholastic and Cartesian intellectualist metaphysics right through to Kant, that the spirit is removed. As a mind, there is more like a substance, thing, or finished event. This for Gentile is not a truly spiritual view. The idea, the absolute, is not spirit, but the object in the presupposition of spirit. It is an object that cannot be identified with the spirit without annulling itself as spirit in the process. In doing so, it collapses into a simple presupposition of an ulterior spiritual position, in relation to which it becomes a noble reality. 
For Gentile, our thought is act or process, not substance. As for the old idealism, he says, it declared it to be substance, by which it meant that it was the subject of an activity of which it was independent, an activity therefore which it could realize or not realize without thereby losing or gaining its own being. In our view, the mind has no existence apart from its manifestations. For these manifestations are according to us its own inward and essential realization. We can also say of our mind that it is our experience, so long as experience we mean the act of experiencing pure experience, that which is living and real. Now, modern idealism, starting with Kant, had one important figure, and that was Hegel. For Gentile, Hegel started a revolution in idealism that he did not finish, as Hegel understood the impact of the Kantian view. The transcendental ego of Kant is not substance but thought. And here we say thought cannot mind making the old and the new understanding of mind clear. When we speak of thought, we speak of the mind as an act. For Gentile, not even Berkeley understood this understanding of mind as thought. Although Berkeley identified representation within the existence of that which is perceived, his conception has nothing to do with negation. Kantian or Hegelian thought, which is the act of thinking activity, would also understand Berkeleyan representation as something presupposed by thought. It is with Hegel, therefore, that we see the beginning of the new idealism, an idealism that can no longer be called naturalism, but something akin to spiritualism. Hegel, as stated, did not follow his revolution through to the end. He still had the elements of the old Platonic view that he could not shake off. This view of Gentile is divided. On the one hand, it presents itself as an activity that thinks, and on the other, as a reality understood as both object and presupposition of thought. And in both, we see the old platonic view rear in its head. They both hold that reality has transcended the act of thought. In Hegel, we see the reason of the world and also pure nature. Thus we may say that Gentile grew out of the philosophy of Kant and Hegel. But for Gentile, because of these elements in Hegel, it is his goal to take Hegel to the next step. Gentile sees the same problem in Hegel as another Hegelian philosopher, Bentrando Spaventa. And so there must be a new idealism in which that naturalistic world is removed. The new idealism must view no reality outside of knowledge. Spaventa here was a needed upheaval of the whole Hegelian system to iron out the seeming contradictions in Hegel found by Spaventa and Gentile. Gentile found Hegelian idealism as Hegel had left it and felt to correct the mistake in Hegel's absolute idealism. To fix it, Spaventa viewed that the naturalistic element of the dialectic had to be removed. In pure experience and historical reality, he explains his idealism by speaking about the divine comedy. Comedy is a creation of those who study it. It is not just some poem from 1320, as it is the comedy that we study as the creation of those who study it that is real. A divine poem from 1320 is nothing but an abstract. Just try securing in thought something we assume to already be determined. The very act will be a new creation which will resuscitate the process. This means that self-consciousness and its individuality is formed in the infinite and that this individuality cannot, therefore, be divided into multiple discrete individuals, but in a continuous process of individuation. The same can be said of the Divine Comedy, for example, which is not, strictly speaking, a work of certain individual imagination undertaken in the narrow confines of the life of a man who died in 1321. That would be an abstraction. The real divine comedy is that which we read, which we interpret, and to which we cast judgment. Thus our work extends the process by which we establish that spiritual creation that we call the comedy. It is carried out across a series of centuries. It is tangled up in a whole progress of the spirit and flows into the general current of thought, or of culture. With all this in mind, it is not hard to understand the relativistic nature of the proper fascist view, nor the rejection by fascism of natural law. As in Rocco's political doctrine of fascism, natural law is rejected as liberal, but more than feeding onto liberalism, it would be impossible to build a natural law under this idealism. The idea of something outside of our act of thinking is impossible here. On another note, we may speak of how Gentile views God. For the Hegelians in the Anglosphere, God held an important role in their idealism. It would be hard to think of Anglos in America and England holding the same lack of belief in God as McTaggart. Gentile holds that his idealism is compatible with Christianity and Catholicism. However, he holds God as a man-god, et deus in nobis, God is within us. Here, there is a spiritual unity of man and God, but, moreover, it is a reality which waits for us to construct, a reality which is true even now of love and will, because it is the inward effort of the soul, its living process, not its ideal and external model. 
It is man himself who rises above humanity and becomes God. And even God is no longer a reality who already is, but the God who is begotten in us and is ourselves insofar as we with our whole being rise to him. Here mind is no longer intellect but will. The world is no longer what is known but what is made, and therefore not only can we begin to conceive the mind as freedom or moral activity, but the world, the whole world of the Christian is freed and redeemed. The whole world is a world which is what it would be, or a world, as we say, essentially moral. We may say of spiritual reality what the great Christian writers have said of God, whoever seeks him shall find him, but to find spiritual reality one must be willing to put his whole being into the search, as though he would satisfy the deepest needs of his own life. Therefore, faith is a virtue and supposes love. In this lies the folly of the atheist dams that the existence of God should be proved to him without his being relieved of his atheism. Equally fatuous is the materialist denial of spiritual reality. He would have the philosopher show him spirit in nature. Nature which by its very definition is the absence of mind. Wonderful are the words of the psalmist. Only in his foolish heart could he have said it. Gentili's theory has two main sources. Namely, the theory of truth formulated by Giambattista Vico in The New Science, which consists in pointing out an epistemic dependence of the objective reality on the self-thematization of the subject and the object. Such an epistemic dependence Gentili calls spiritual reality and moral constructivism. Gentili's moral constructivism endorses conceptions of liberty, equality, and autonomy, or autarky broadly similar to Kantian theory, but arrives at them from a separate starting position and subsequent route. This means that these conceptions' details are subtly different and their political corollaries strikingly so. Gentili's response to the fact of pluralism is to allow the state or the persons representing it to set about consciously determining or at least limiting with which associations people identify themselves. That those associations arise organically or as a result of social engineering is largely irrelevant to whether the resultant moral beliefs can impose obligations on those party to them. Gentili's moral theory shows that constructivism is not guaranteed to lead to anyone's benign conclusion. In response to the implausibility of substantive moral realism, constructivists offer a strictly formal alternative, but doing this gives them no special entitlement to specify what substantive beliefs and values may serve as the construction materials, nor what conclusions a properly configured and applied procedure may reach. Designers of constructivist procedures must walk a tightrope between under and over, determination of outcomes. If too little is assumed at the beginning, the procedure's formal elements will be left in the hands of its protagonist. As a result, it will be unable to produce firm, reliable, and replicable results since one person's version need not resemble any other. If too much is assumed, the procedure will beg its questions, issuing results that reinforce those same assumptions. The process of construction would be eddy around a core of substantive presuppositions. Kantian theorists assume more than they are entitled to in order to generate a benign and universal moral order. Gentili assumes less, though not of course so little as he claims. The Gentili moral theory calls for rigorous procedural justification of the state's demands, and implicitly rules out hierarchy and dogmatism. His method of imminence sees moral decisions as something that cannot be a purely abstract choice between predefined sets of options, but between acts to which we must assign values as we go along. So value is constructed and brought to the material world, the brute facts before us, rather than found free, standing in the world. Lay and bear the constructive business of thinking, but our awareness of the procedure's formal elements cannot tell us what conclusions it will lead. With its constant review, self-criticism, and revision, actual thought is indispensable if actions have any value whatsoever. Constructivism, if it is to be more than well-intentioned guesswork, must embrace the contingent and provisional nature of the act of thinking. Therefore, Gentili proposed a form of absolute immanentism, building off of Machiavelli's pragmatism and realism, in which the divine was the present conception of reality in the totality of one individual's thinking as an evolving, growing, and dynamic process. Many times accused of solipsism, Gentili maintained his philosophy to be a humanism that sensed the possibility of nothing beyond what was collegiate in perception. The self's human thinking, in order to communicate as eminence, is to be human like oneself, made a cohesive empathy of the same self without an external division, and is not modeled as objects to one's own thinking. Actualism, for this reason, rejects a privation and is an expression of the only freedom possible within objective contingencies, 
where the transcendental self does not exist as an object. The dialectical co-substantiation of others necessary to understand the empirical self are felt as true others when found to be the non-relativistic subjectivity of that whole self and essentially unified with the spirit of such higher self, where others can be truly known, rather than thought as windowless monads. It becomes a synthesis of everything within the whole. So Gentili's theory is best understood as a radical constructivist doctrine according to which all thinking has a moral and ethical character. It promotes not uncritical submission to the state, but free and self-regulating thought without fully objective reality. Thus, Gentili demonstrates both the plausibility and the limitations of any uncompromising form of anti-realist constructivism. Some of the first writings that we have of Giovanni Gentile deal with Karl Marx, and while Gentili's philosophical system was not yet fully developed, one thing that we clearly see is his anti-materialism and his Hegelian influence. Principally, this comes from Gentili's view of Marx's materialism, which went against the official stance of the Soviet Union. Gentili does not see Marx as a materialist, but he instead argues that Marx was a confused idealist who tried to correct Hegel by dialectically blending idealism and materialism into one, but this ended in a complete failure for Marx. So let's first view how Lenin and other Marxists view Marx's philosophy. Here I cite Lenin's book Materialism and Imperial Criticism. Lenin argues that sensation, thought, and consciousness is products of matter, saying, such are the views of materialism in general and of Marx and Engels in particular. So for Lenin and most Marxists, to be a Marxist means to believe that everything, including consciousness itself, is material. Gentili instead argued, in Marx, praxis is synonymous with human sensory activity. Marx's praxis is also noteworthy in that it denies other theories that posit the subject and the object as two abstract concepts and instead has them inseparably linked to each other so that their actual reality results from the relationship to the organism in which and through which they find their necessary fulfillment, and outside of which they are nothing but abstractions. Gentili elaborates on his interpretation, saying that for Marx, reality is a subjective production of man, a production, however, of sensory activity, not of thought, as Hegel and other idealists believed. Ultimately, for Marx, the subjective subject and the objective material reality are dialectically linked with each other. Materialism has been injected into Hegelian idealism, but it is not the vulgar materialism like Engels and Lenin espouse. Marx is like the materialist of old, in the sense that he sees the world as composed of merely matter as the good materialist does. But his Hegelian background doesn't allow him to see matter as static, but rather it's seen as dialectically dynamic and thus changing. While Gentili applauds Marx for taking on the vulgar materialist in his thesis on Feuerbach, which ends with one of Marx's more famous quotes about how it's the role of philosophers to not merely describe the world but to change the world, and it is from Marx's criticism of Feuerbach's vulgar materialism, which in itself has traces of idealism, that Giovanni Gentile sees Marx espousing a philosophy of praxis, a concept Gentile himself would later adapt in a more proper form. Marx believed that the praxis or the action of human sensor activity, the active process of taking in stimulus through our senses, is the basis of our reality. Reality is the subjective production of man in his sensor activity. Elucidating his point, he called Feuerbach out for deducing humans to be their products of the environment and education since this is only half the story. Marx believed that humans are a product of their environment and education, but he adds on the important corollary that humans can change their environment and education. So, there's a mutual relation between the subject, humanity, and the object, the environment. Gentili then turns to attack Marx. For, if sense is the basis of reality, the question arises of, who provides this datum, this outside or external information? Gentili asserts that, the sense creates the sensation. Since outside of the mind, beyond the external information, there is nothing except purely physical fact. And whatever makes or creates these facts, or, as Gentili puts it, the vibrations of the ether, is outside the purview of human sensory activity, which Marx makes the building blocks of his metaphysics. In other words, the matter is outside of sense. This shows that Marx's theory of sensory praxis is not even able to justify the existence of matter, and it tears down the entire metaphysical foundation of Marx. Another issue brought up by Gentile is that by even arguing for the existence of a philosophy of praxis, you are already transcending sensible reality 
since you are arguing for the existence of something immaterial and metaphysical which is not perceptible by human senses. What Gentile's criticism of Marx ultimately boils down to in the final analysis is that materialism mixed with idealism is an untenable reality. Marx failed to surpass Hegel and instead created an incoherent philosophical system that takes elements of idealism and materialism and makes the system internally contradict its own standards. Gentile doesn't have to cite history or economics to deal with the problems of Marx. He simply reveals its own internal mechanisms as philosophically bankrupt. Gentile also criticized Marx's philosophy of history, which would later be called dialectical materialism or sometimes historical materialism by his followers. Gentile sees Marx's philosophy of history as truly a philosophy of history in the same vein as Vico or Hegel. It was not just a historiographical tool that could be used to view and understand the past. Marx uses it as a way to predict the future and make a prior claims of what will happen in the future, and thus Gentile argues it has entered into the realm of philosophy proper. But while Gentile takes up the view that most Marxists had at the time, that Marx truly did create a philosophy of history, he uses this to further show faults in Marx. While Marx may have tried to create a philosophy of history, he fails in this regard for many of the same reasons Marx's materialism of praxis also falls short. It's an attempt to overcome Hegel that completely misses the mark. Hegel's philosophy of history makes sense at least because the absolute or spirit is not about material reality like vulgar materialists like Lenin believed in, but rather about the immaterial mind. Hegel talks about the historical development of spirit, not matter. The absolute is a philosophical concept that embeds itself in all of reality and thus can be the proper subject of philosophy, and it can be explained how the absolute develops dialectically. But when philosophy is describing the projection of the relative, or matter, it has sunk to the level of the astronomer predicting eclipses and falls short of being a proper philosophy. If you wish to be at the level of metaphysics when it comes to history, you have to rely on something that is above matter, but also moves it, but is not moved by the matter, such as Hegel's absolute, which moves dialectically and drags matter along with it. But the absolute is never changed by the relative or the material. Gentile concludes by calling Marx's history one of the most wretched deviations of Hegelian thought, since it attempts to have the material drag the immaterial instead of vice versa. Gentile concludes this in relation to Marxism. We will say therefore in conclusion that an eclecticism of contradictory elements is the general character of this philosophy of Marxist, of which some of his disciples today are perhaps not greatly wrong and not knowing what to do. There are many fruitful ideas at its foundation, which, taken separately, are worthy of meditation, but isolated they do not belong, as has been proved, to Marx, nor can they therefore justify the word Marxism, which is sought to be synonymous with a purely realistic philosophy. Some of the more notable works to be published by Marx posthumously in the USSR were Economic and Philosophical Manuscripts of 1844 and The German Ideology. The manuscripts of 1844 specifically go to show the idealist tendency of Marx that Gentile was able to pick out from the notes on Feuerbach, which Marx had written down in a notebook. And there is no defense of the vulgar or crass materialism like the likes of Lenin, who reduced everything to matter and would even go so far as to falsely attribute this view to Marx himself. Moreover, the manuscripts of 1844 were softly repressed by the Soviets, and an entire chapter in the German ideology was fabricated by David Ryazanov, who wrote a chapter called I, Feuerbach. The Soviets did this to justify a concrete continuity between Marx and Lenin's views, which technically did not exist as was only a consequence of fabrications and repression. Gentile also believed Marx's conception of the dialectic to be the fundamental flaw of his application to system making. To the Neo-Hegelian Gentile, Marx had made the dialectic into an external object and therefore had abstracted it by making it part of the material process of historical development. The dialectic to Gentile could only be something of human precepts, something that is an active part of human thinking. It was, to Gentile, a concrete subject and not an abstract object. Gentile expounded on how humans think in forms, where in one side of a dual opposite could not be thought of without its complement, upward would not be known without downward, and heat couldn't be known without cold. While each are opposites, they are codependent for each other's realization. These were creations that existed as dialectic, only in human thinking, and couldn't be confirmed outside of which, and especially could not be said to exist in a condition external to human thought 
like independent matter and a world outside of personal subjectivity or as an empirical reality when not conceived in unity and from the standpoint of the human mind. To Gentile, Marx's externalizing of the dialectic was essentially a fetishistic mysticism. Though when viewed externally thus, it followed that Marx could then make claims to the effect of what state or condition the dialectic objectively existed in history. A posteriori of where an individual's opinion was while comporting oneself to the totalized whole of society, i.e. people themselves could by such a view be ideological backwards and left behind from the current state of the dialectic and not themselves be part of what is actively creating the dialectic as it is. Gentili thought this was absurd and that there was no positive independently existing dialectical object. Rather, the dialectic was natural to the state, as it is, which means that the interests of composing the state are composing the dialectic by their living organic process of holding oppositional views within that state and unified therein, it being the mean condition of those interests as ever they exist. Even criminality is unified as necessarily dialectic to be subsumed into the state and creation and natural outlet of the dialectic of the positive state as ever it is. The praxis of Gentile is in order to make history proceed correctly. Just as it is not enough to overthrow the dialectic of Hegel in order to find the correct path in the movement of reality, it is not enough to complete praxis in order to make history real. Just as it is not enough to make the dialectic concrete in order to make reality historic. It is a matter of understanding that the pure act does not exist, that the act is always impure. At stake is our ability to envision, within the content of our thoughts, a specific and always determinate impurity, a concrete entity, in other words, a fullness of the other thinking process within the framework of a particular and determinate objective reality. This would carry over to Marxists like Antonio Gramsci, who followed a left gentile interpretation to find an original philosophy of Marxism. Such as in his prison notebooks, Antonio Gramsci proposes the distinctive notion of a philosophy of praxis. Gramsci deals with this problem at a different level, that of the translatability of languages. He deals not much with historically defined languages, but rather with those linguistic cultural ensembles proper to specific disciplines, worldviews, and particular cognitive universes. In this way, he recovers a problem that in the Marxist tradition corresponds to that of the superstructure, as Marx called it. Gramsci's position is not the impossibility of translating, but that we always translate when we talk, when we think. For Croce, this is limited to philosophy, and for Gentile, this is extended to all spiritual life. Still, the key of this universal interpreting or translating is not and cannot any longer be the philosophy of the spirit or of the act through which the spirit eternally recreates itself, but the new philosophy of praxis. All the secrets of culture production are in historical and social praxis, and the Marxian philosophy of praxis is the one that knows how to read its historical truth. In this way, Gramsci goes beyond Marx and attempts this with Gentile's philosophy. With that, Gramsci gets close to that rediscovery of hermeneutics inside Marxism. But instead, Marxism closed itself by accepting a sort of naturalistic materialism and positivistic dogma that rejected idealism and even persecuted these cultural movements by eliminating or suppressing them softly during Stalin's leadership in the USSR. For Gentile, the state was the supreme ethical entity. The individual existed merely to submit and merge his will and reason for being to it. Rebellion against the state in the name of ideals was therefore unjustifiable on any level. To Gentile, fascism was the natural outgrowth of actual idealism. Gentile foresaw an order wherein opposites of all kinds weren't to be considered as existing independently from each other, that publicness and privateness as broad interpretations were currently false as imposed by all former kinds of government, including capitalism and communism, and that only the reciprocal totalitarian state of corporatism, a state, could defeat these problems, which are made from reifying as an external reality that which is in fact, to Gentile, only a reality in thinking. Gentile postulated, after Hegel, the opposite that the subject is concrete and the object a mere abstraction, or rather, that what was conventionally dubbed subject is in fact only a conditional object, and that the true subject is the act of being or essence of the object. Gentile even said, we follow Hegel, the philosopher of the state. Being influenced by the Hegelian theory of the state, Gentile justified the corporatist system 
wherein the individualized and particular interests of all divergent groups were to be personally incorporated into the ethical state, each to be considered a bureaucratic branch of the state itself and given official leverage. Gentile, rather than believing the private to be swallowed synthetically within the public as Marx would have it in his objective dialectic, believed that public and private were a priori identified within each other in active and a subjective dialectic. One could not be subsumed fully into the other as they already are beforehand the same. In such a manner, each is the other in their own fashion and from their respective relative and reciprocal position. Yet both constitute the state itself, and neither is free from it, nothing ever being truly free from it. The state, as in Hegel, existing as an eternal condition and not an objective abstract collection of atomistic values and facts of the particulars about what is positively governing the people at any given time. While Gentile rejected historical materialism and embraced a philosophy of praxis, aimed not only at interpreting the world but at changing it. According to a Del Nocian interpretation at least therefore, fascism would not be a negation of Marxism at all but rather a revision of it which reinterprets praxis as spirituality. Gentile went so far as to declare fascism is a form of socialism, in fact it is its most viable form. In short, Fascism promises to be a further revolution from the Marxist-Leninist one. Gentile placed himself in the Marxist tradition, and his dialectic was a concrete subject and not an abstract object, like how humans think in forms wherein one side of a dual opposite could not be thought of without its complement, therefore necessitating praxis for change which is reliant on mind. Another aspect of Gentile that needs to be explained thoroughly is how did his views translate into his rationale for fascism. This came about through a couple of ways. 1. Perception is due to thinking, which takes place in the mind. Without the mind of the thinking subject there can be no perception. Without perception there can be no understanding of reality as such because human beings have no way of accessing reality outside of perception. 2. The act of thinking itself, as perception, defines reality because our entire reality is constituted by the act of thinking. Reality itself can be equated with the act of thinking. The human being has no access to anything outside of thinking, i.e. reality. 3. Reality and the act of thinking are one and the same. There is no practical distinction between the thinking subject and the external object. Even if an object of reality exists, completely separate from the human mind, the human being has no way of accessing that reality independently of the mind. His reality is entirely constituted by the act of thinking, which takes place in the mind. 4. Both subject and object belong to the same holistic whole, and the apparent distinction between the two is ultimately illusory. Though maintaining such a distinction may be a useful fiction, as in the natural sciences, in order for reality to be experienced, there must be first a union of subject and object in mind through the act of thinking. 5. Terms such as mind and subject refer not only to the individual, but also to higher stages of subjectivity that transcend the individual and encompass discrete collections of people. This higher subjectivity or greater mind can be likened to the Hegelian spirit or Geist. 6. The non-duality of subject and object and the equation of thinking within reality, this collective spirit or mind, constitutes a greater reality in and of itself. This spirit drives history and is reflected in the laws, customs, and culture that define a nation. Things such as law are the expression of a general will or spirit that transcends the individual, yet the law is internalized in the individual subject and constitutes a part of the individual's reality, and the other members of that society also share this reality. 7. If subject and object are synthesized in the act of thinking prior to the experience of reality, then on one level of the higher subjectivity, that of the spirit, there is no essential difference between the individuals who constitute a given society. As the act of thinking constitutes reality, collective thinking constitutes collective reality that is manifest in the state, defined in spiritual terms as a higher subjectivity or greater mind. 8. All individuals are constituted in the spiritual state, meaning that individuals, subject, and the state as spirit, object, constitute a single organic whole. 9. There is thus no distinction between society as a collection of atomic individuals and state, representing the higher mind or spirit. The individual is not subject to the state, 
as in the classical formulation of authoritarianism, nor is the state subject to the individual, as in the classic formulation of liberalism. Rather, the state is the individual, and the individual is the state. The state is not merely an abstract external object. You are a part of the state, and the state is part of you. 10. Derived from all of this is the doctrine of Gentili's totalitarianism slash ethical state, which lies at the heart of fascism. The word totalitarianism should not be understood in its dystopia or Orwellian sense as an overbearing, all-powerful state that suppresses and crushes the individual. Rather, the word totalitarian refers to the ideal that the individuals and the state constitute a single totality without any conflict or antagonism between them. The means through which the totalitarian spiritual state is actualized is corporatism, which means the incorporation of social bodies into the state such that the state itself constitutes the aggregate of society and the aggregate of society constitutes the state. Both are part of one single holistic organism. The word corporation is derived from the Latin word corpus, meaning body. Far from crushing the individual, such a corporatist, i.e. a totalitarian state, embodies the individual just as the individual in an army is not crushed, but empowered by his inclusion into a larger collective regiment or division. To quote directly from Giovanni Gentile, the state does not swallow the individual as liberal critics would have it, but the opposite is true. For in this conception, the state is the will of the individual himself in its universal and absolute aspect, and thus the individual swallows the state. This is interpreted by Gentile as his justification for legal naturalism, something Gentile took from Marx. Gentile used this philosophic frame of the state to systematize every item of interest that was now the subject of the rule of absolute self-identification, thus rendering as correct every consequence of the hypothesis. Gentile's view of corporatism can also be seen as a continuation of Hegel's philosophy of right, more specifically his civil society, where it talks of corporations as the organs of the state. Furthermore, he uses Sorel to distinguish and define fascism more concretely. It is necessary to distinguish between socialism and socialism in fact, between idea and the idea of the same socialist conception, in order to distinguish among them those that are inimical to fascism. It is well known that Sorelian syndicalism, out of which the thought and the political method of fascism emerged, conceived itself as the genuine interpretation of Marxist communism, the dynamic conception of history in which force as violence functions as an essential is of unquestioned Marxist origin. Those notions flowed into other currents of contemporary thought that have themselves via alternative routes arrived at a vindication of the form of state implacable but absolutely rational, that finds historic necessity in the very spiritual dynamism through which it realizes itself. Totalitarianism should also be considered from a communitarian perspective, in the context of Hegel's statism. Gentile then quotes Hegel, Nothing short of the state is the actualization of freedom, and that the state is the march of God on earth. Fascism holds to positive liberty for this reason. Positive liberty, i.e. limitations upon an individual or group of people to act in its self-interest, as opposed to negative liberty, which is freedom from external restraint on one's actions. Gentile in turn argues that Sorel's myth can be used to order individuals into a general will. A good example of this would be religion. People who are devout Christians will most certainly die for Christ if they must. In this analogy, people are willing to die for the nation. Gentile used this to argue, as Hegel did, that state is spirit, and, therefore, because history is moved by spirit, this means a nation is only great if the state embodies the spirit of making history. For a state to be powerful enough to make history, its interests must be one with the people. This is something that echoes what Hegel called a desired harmony in the philosophy of history. From here, Gentile's views of totalitarianism can be extended to a totalitarian way of life for the individual. This became Gentile's foundation for the Uomo Fascista, the fascist new man, and Nietzsche's Ubermensch even influenced it. Gentile quotes, Thus spoke Zarathustra. The protagonist contends that man is something which ought to be overcome, that apes are a laughingstock to man, and that man would be a laughingstock to Ubermensch. Fascism, he claimed, was a man engaged in moral struggle with bourgeois materialism and anything that degrades the spirit of man into becoming like an animal. Hence, one of Gentile's more fiery quotes. 
It is in this name that order, authority, justice against the chaos of egalitarianism, the anarchy of universal embraces, and the gouge of the strong over the weak. This is our stand against atheism, moral fatalism, and historical determinism, and against the irresponsibility and cowardice of materialism. Giovanni Gentile was born in Castelvetrano, Italy. He won a fierce competition to become one of the four exceptional students of the prestigious Scuola Normale Superiore di Pisa, where he enrolled in the Faculty of Humanities. In 1898, he graduated in Letters and Philosophy with a dissertation titled Rosmini e Gioberti, which he realized under the supervision of Donato Giaggia, a disciple of Betrando Speventa. Gentile was also a Catholic, but he occasionally identified himself as an atheist, albeit one who was still culturally a Catholic. He later became extremely devout as a Catholic after 1920. One of his earliest writings was The Philosophy of Marx. It's Gentile's critique of Marxism, and was so well researched and argued that Vladimir Lenin was impressed by it. Lenin even went as far as to recommend it in Karl Marx, a brief biographical sketch with an exposition of Marxism. During his academic career, Gentili served in a number of positions including the Professor of History at the University of Palermo in March 27, 1910, Professor of Theoretical Philosophy at the University of Pisa, August 9, 1914, Professor of the History of Philosophy at the University of Rome, November 11, 1917, and later as a Professor of Theoretical Philosophy, 1926. Commissioner of the Scuola Normale Superiore di Pisa, 1928-32, and later as its Director, 1932-43. And Vice President of Bocconi University in Milan, 1934-44. Gentili's advocacy for war came to be known by the Fasci, the group headed by Mussolini that would later become the Fascist Party. Gentile, as the main doctrinaire of fascism, was the one who led the discarding of anarchist remains of revolutionary syndicalism. Gentile's ideas of corporatism were co-formulated by Alfredo Rocco and Sergio Panunzio. The thesis of the fascist model had many peculiarities of its past revolutionary syndicalism. Gentile pointed to Georges Sorel and Francesco Saveri Merlino as revising Karl Marx to fit the times and gave Mussolini's dictatorship a veneer of revolutionary legitimacy. All are noted by both the Italian philosophers Augusto del Noce and Diego Fusaro, and historians such as Zeev Sternhell and A. James Greger. Gentile enjoyed fruitful intellectual relations with Benedetto Croce in 1899, and particularly during their joint editorship of La Critica from 1903 to 1922. Giovanni Gentile encouraged him to read Hegel. Croce's famous commentary on Hegel, What is Living and What is Dead of the Philosophy of Hegel, was published in 1907. Unfortunately, they broke philosophically and politically in the early 1920s over Gentile's embrace of fascism. The dispute with Croce was over the historical inevitability of fascism. Earlier, they cooperated in philosophical polemics against positivism. Gentile's reform of Italian education was based partly on Croce's earlier suggestions. His educational reforms in 1923, which Mussolini would later dub the most fascist of reforms, remained in force well beyond the fascist regime and were only partly abolished in 1962. In 1922, Gentile was named Minister of Public Education for the fascist government. In this capacity, he instituted the Forma Gentile, a reformation of the Italian secondary school system that had a lasting impact on the Italian educational system. His philosophical work included The Theory of Mind as Pure Act and Logic as a Theory of Knowledge, both of which are necessary to understand his philosophy. Ugo Spirito, a student of Gentile, managed to become another fascist intellectual under his guidance. In 1925, Gentile headed two constitutional reform commissions that helped establish the corporate state of fascism. He would serve as president of the Fascist State's Grand Council of Public Education from 1926 to 1928 and even gained membership in the powerful Fascist Grand Council from 1925 to 1929. The doctrine of fascism, attributed to Mussolini, was actually ghostwritten with Gentile. It was first published in 1932 in the Italian Encyclopedia, wherein he described the traits and characteristics of Italian fascism at the time. Corporatism, philosopher kings, totalitarianism, imperialism, the abolition of the parliamentary system, idealism, etc. He also wrote the Manifesto of the Fascist Intellectuals, which was signed by a number of writers and intellectuals including Luigi Perundello, Gabriel D'Annunzio, Filippo Marinetti, and Giuseppe Ungaretti. Mussolini's What is Fascism essay was written in 1932 with the help of Giovanni Gentile. 
With this definition, Mussolini set out to define what fascism was and how it would bring Italy back to its former glory. Gentili also put out a lesser known essay in 1928 called The Philosophic Basis of Fascism to expand upon Hegelian statism. Throughout his career, Gentili worked intimately and extensively with Jewish scholars from various countries. With the rise of German anti-Semitism in the 1930s, he facilitated the placement in Italy of Jewish refugees. Paul Oscar Christeller was one of those refugee scholars with whom Gentili shared an intimate work relationship. Gentili sought to secure his Italian citizenship, and when that was subsequently impossible, he assisted him with funds to underwrite his immigration to the United States. Italian Jews like Giorgio Fano, Rodolfo Mandolfo, Gina Arias, Giorgio Mortars, Emilio Servadio, and Attilio Momigliano have testified to Gentili's assistance and support. Giuseppe Tucci, who is an Italian Orientalist, explorer, archaeologist, historian, and an author of scientific articles and books, co-founded together with Giovanni Gentile in 1933 the Italian Institute for the Middle and the Far East with the aim of promoting cultural, political, and economic relations between Italy and Asian countries. In 1995, it merged with the Italian African Institute in Rome, giving life to the Italian Institute for Africa and the East. Giovanni Gentile was the organization's president from 1933 to 1944. While Gentile had supported the First World War, he did not agree with Mussolini's decision to ally with Nazi Germany. Gentile believed that Italy would become the subordinate partner in the relationship. He also thought that Italy wasn't capable of fighting in another world war. Gentile simply wanted for Mussolini to remain neutral. He remained loyal to Mussolini though, even after the fall of the fascist government in 1943. He supported Mussolini's establishment of the Italian Social Republic, despite having criticized his anti-Jewish and racial laws. Despite this, Gentili still accepted an appointment in its government. And Gentili was the last president of the Royal Academy of Italy from 1943 to 1944. On April 15, 1944, Giovanni Gentili was murdered by communist partisans led by Bruno Fanciulacci. Ironically, Gentili was gunned down after he left a meeting where he had argued for the release of anti-fascists who were accused of being partisans without evidence. This was an episode that divided the Italian anti-fascists and is still a center of controversy, even among Italian communists. His assassination took place in the Salviatino district. Bruno Fanciulacci and Antonio Ignisti stationed themselves near the villa where Gentili was staying. When he arrived by car, they approached him, holding books under their arms to disguise themselves as students. Giovanni Gentile was then subsequently shot to death. Not long after being arrested and tortured during interrogation, Bruno Facciolacci would be killed by the Waffen SS. Dr. Italo Pizzaiolo certified his death, citing a fatal fracture to the skull base and fractures to the wrist and femur, as well as gunshot wound and multiple stab wounds. Gentile was buried in the church of Santa Croce in Florence, where his remains lie perhaps fittingly next to Galileo Galilei, astronomer and physicist and the most famous philosopher and writer Niccolò Machiavelli. As one might imagine, after his death Gentili's name was scorned if not forgotten entirely, such as Alexander Dugan who dismisses him as merely a neo-Hegelian, using this to dismiss him without even understanding his philosophy. In recent years, scholars have begun to re-examine his legacy and contributions to philosophy. This short study of Gentili's actualism is a matter of practical importance. Its analog will be found in the thoughts of revolutionaries throughout the world. While Marxist-Leninism has passed quietly into history, fascism has emerged as something which, which the advanced industrial democracies will have to contend with inside the totalitarian states of the modern age. It is interesting to note that in spite of the general neglect of Gentile, the first article of the Italian constitution seems to be modeled precisely on his view of labor and the citizen. It recites, Italy is a democratic republic, founded upon labor. Giovanni Gentile, for this reason, remains to this day one of Italy's most illustrious, prolific, lucid, poetic, and problematic thinkers. I am a Christian because I believe in the religion of the spirit. I have been a Catholic since I came into the world in June 1875. I am sorry, therefore, not to be able to tell you about any crisis, a sudden conversion, or a thunderbolt. I have been walking the road to Damascus since the day I was born. Every day since then, I have gone on thinking and deepening my ideas. And if you insist on talking about conversions, I can say that my conversion is the story of each and every day.
Giovanni Gentile è stato indubbiamente il più grande filosofo italiano del Novecento, un gigante del pensiero che si può accostare ai grandi nomi della tradizione filosofica novecentesca, come Martin Heidegger ad esempio, come Sartre e come i più grandi che hanno attraversato il secolo, eh, il secolo breve. Giovanni Gentile purtroppo in Italia è un autore su cui ancora pende una damnazio memorie, è un autore su cui appunto eh, vige una sorta di convenzio ad excludendum in nome della quale il suo nome deve essere continuamente diffamato, eh, appiattito sulla vicenda del fascismo, come se Gentile non fosse stato altro che un fascista e non un filosofo eh, la cui portata intellettuale si estende bene al di là del regime fascista, oppure semplicemente Gentile viene silenziato to cool, come se non fosse mai esistito, rimuovendo il fatto fondamentale che Giovanni Gentile sta alla cultura filosofica italiana del Novecento come Hegel sta alla cultura filosofica tedesca dell'Ottocento. Intendo con questa espressione dire che come dopo Hegel tutti gli autori hanno modellato il proprio profilo prendendo posizione rispetto a Hegel, ora adottandone alcune prospettive, vedi Carlo Marx, ora rigettandolo integralmente, vedi Schopenhauer e Kierkegaard, ma comunque sempre dialogando con Hegel come punto di riferimento ideale per il dibattito, secondo la nota tesi di Karl Levitt da Hegel a Nietzsche. Allo stesso modo in Italia la cultura filosofica del Novecento è in maniera pressoché totale determinata dall'incidenza che l'attualismo di Gentile ha esercitato sul panorama filosofico italiano. Faccio notare per inciso che già all'indomani della morte di Gentile, il tragico assassino con cui Gentile fu messo a morte, una delle pagine più tragiche della storia d'Italia insieme anche all'assassinio eh, di Stato compiuto i danni di Antonio Gramsci eh, all'indomani della morte di Gentile subito la cultura filosofica italiana si divise eh, in una destra e in una sinistra attualistiche proprio come dopo la morte di Hegel ancora una volta la cultura filosofica tedesca si divise in una destra e una sinistra eh, hegeliana Direi anzi che come Marx rappresenta la sinistra hegeliana, allo stesso modo Gramsci rappresenta la sinistra attualistica gentiliana, perché come il codice filosofico di Marx è tanto più hegeliano e dialettico, quanto più vorrebbe negare Hegel e la dialettica hegeliana, analogamente, secondo un tema che già metteva bene in luce del noce, eh, Gramsci è tanto più gentiliano e attualista quanto più vuole smarcarsi da gentile. Prova ne che appunto Gramsci continuamente prende posizione nei quaderni del carcere contro gentile eh, proprio per nascondere, analogamente come faceva Marx con Hegel, la propria genesi gentiliana, la propria filosofia eh, profondamente influenzata dall'attualismo gentiliano. Ora, i meriti di Giovanni Gentile per la cultura filosofica italiana del Novecento sono enormi e non è questa la sede per ripercorrerli tutti. Mi limito tuttavia a enunciarne senza alcuna pretesa di esaustività alcuni. In primo luogo direi che il merito grandioso di Gentile è stato quello di favorire, uso la sua stessa espressione, la rinascita dell'idealismo, cioè di reintrodurre un'attenzione per il pensiero idealistico in Italia che eh, complice naturalmente anche l'impresa culturale di Benedetto Croce, l'interlocutore eh, privilegiato di Gentile anche dopo la loro rottura, i testi di Gentile hanno sempre, anche dopo la rottura con Croce, un riferimento sia pure polemico al pensiero crociano, di aver appunto introdotto in Italia la rinascita dell'idealismo. Quella che Gentile attua, secondo la sua stessa formula, è la riforma della dialettica hegeliana riforma che può essere interpretata in vari modi, con giudizi certo diversi. Antonio Gramsci ad esempio parlava di eh, controriforma, per mostrare come fosse molto meglio Hegel rispetto a Gentile, come fosse molto meglio la dialettica hegeliana rispetto a quella gentiliana. Ma al di là di questi giudizi di merito, quel che conta in questa mia sintesi, tutt'altro che esaustiva, è mostrare come Gentile abbia come grande merito aver introdotto Hegel in, in Italia. Un Hegel riletto, o meglio, riformato in senso attualistico, certamente, cioè nell'idea appunto eh, del, dell'atto in atto come fondamento stesso del pensiero idealistico. L'idea cioè appunto che tutto esiste sempre e solo nell'atto del pensiero che pensandolo lo pone. O come anche Gentile dice nei suoi scritti, eh, 
il pensiero non può essere pensato se non è pensante, non può essere il pensiero pensato se non vi è pensiero pensante, quindi priorità assoluta dell'atto in atto del pensare e quindi priorità assoluta della prassi rispetto alla realtà. Questo implica a livello generale che la filosofia di Gentile possa quanto dialettica attualistica a tutti gli effetti considerarsi come un episodio della, potremmo dire, eh, defatalizzazione del mondo. Il mondo nella filosofia di Gentile cessa di essere un dato di fatto brutto che fieri in equit, come dice Gentile, cioè che non può divenire, e prende a essere inteso come atto in atto, come esito inesauribile della prassi umana che lo pone e che perciò stesso può trasformarlo. Gentile scrive nel sistema di logica come teoria del conoscere il mondo sempre è quale noi lo facciamo che è appunto la negazione totale di ogni visione positivistica che coltiva l'ideale del dato di fatto intrasformabile ed è anche la negazione di ogni materialismo dogmatico e meccanicista Gentile dice nella sua ultima opera, il suo testamento spirituale Genesi, struttura della società, dice che il filosofo deve essere l'apostolo dell'ideale, mai del fatto compiuto, l'ideale come eh, ideale orientativo per la prassi. Ora questa visione di Gentile, che naturalmente molto risente della dialettica hegeliana, no? la priorità dell'atto sul fatto, ma anche della filosofia fittiana, della dottrina della scienza, la tatandlung da cui deriva la tatzake, cioè la realtà concepita come processo in atto con cui l'io si oggettiva, la prassi dell'io si trasforma in cristallizzazione di quella prassi e quello è il mondo oggettivo, prassi considerata non in atto ma come esito di quell'atto. Ebbene in questa vicenda filosofica in cui si compendia per sommi capi la dialettica idealistica, molta parte anche la filosofia di Marx, non dimentichiamo, lo dico per inciso, che Gentile pubblica nel 1899 un volume che raccoglie due suoi contributi importanti intitolato La filosofia di Marx, dove appunto, come mostrato da molti interpreti peraltro, viene lì già maturando embrionalmente il proprio codice attualistico che nasce come eh, assimilazione del prassismo marxiano delle 11 tesi su Feuerbach. Tutta la realtà è praxis, è esito di una prassi. Qui c'è già, potremmo dire, una riforma di Hegel riformato tramite Marx e il concetto della prassi come fondamento della realtà. Non dimentichiamo, peraltro, altro grandissimo merito di Giovanni Gentile dal mio punto di vista, che se in Italia, Gramsci, se in Italia Marx viene recepito nel primo novecento come filosofo della praxis, ciò è merito di Gentile che nel suo libro La filosofia di Marx presenta Marx come metafisico puro, come idealista nato e come filosofo della praxis. Il Marx di Gramsci, dei quaderni del carcere, è tutto cielo gentiliano. Quando, quando Gramsci dirà filosofia della praxis non farà altro che presentare un Marx attualistico, il Marx di Gentile, e soprattutto non farà altro che declinare come propria filosofia, la filosofia della praxis, l'attualismo di Gentile riletto in chiave di